moderator for this event taking place right now in the city of Clearwater's library. They're building a new city hall, so the library has been gracious enough to allow this to be the chambers, which it has been, I guess, for a couple of years now. That's right. So we are expecting a wonderful time tonight with all of the candidates who are going to be with us. Uh, and then tomorrow night, we're going to get an opportunity to talk to the two people that are running for mayor. If you're in, you know the way it works in the city of Clearwater, we have council seats that rotate when they're going to be elected. Uh, there are a total of five positions. The mayor is considered to be seat number uh, one, I believe. These are candidates for number two and candidates for number three, seat number two and three. But it's an at-large situation, so you end up voting for everybody. So isn't that convenient? So the candidates will have one minute to answer the questions, and we have a light system that I'm going to demonstrate for you right now. When the green light is on, that means you can go. You actually kind of ignore that one. When the yellow one flashes, it means you have 15 seconds to wrap up your answer. And then when the red light goes, we have a little sounder, and it'll go bing or something like that. And that means you need to wrap up uh, relatively soon. And I'll usually have a lot of grace. I'll give you five or six seconds if you need to wrap it up. But if you're going to do the preamble to the Constitution, I will probably cut you off at that time. But I'll do it politely. And then at the very end, you'll have one minute where you can really put in your final pitch and tell everybody why you're the best candidate. Uh, now, we're going to be very civil. There's going to be no attacking candidates by name, although you can point out the differences between yourself and your opponents. Now, the audience behind me, let's hear our audience. Yeah. You will not be hearing them until the very end of our performance. We've already talked to the audience, and we're going to keep this very polite as possible uh, to make sure that uh, we have the opportunity to talk about these questions. Also, speak up loudly. The uh, acoustics here are a little bit strained, but uh, let's get started right now. The candidates are sitting alphabetically by seats number two and three. And when I say your name, raise your hand. In council seat number two, we have Mark Bunker, Ryan Cotton, and Michael Mastrosario. In seat number three, Jared Leone, Michael Menino, and Javante Scott. Well, here we go. Really simple. Mr. Bunker, why are you the most qualified for this position? Well, I've been fortunate enough to be seated in seat two for the past four years, and I've, I've tried to fight very hard for the folks of Clearwater. Uh, I'm proud to say that I've earned the uh, endorsement of the Clearwater Firefighters and the Clearwater Police uh, FOP. Um, Clearwater has a unique problem here uh, with the Church of Scientology. And for the past 25 years, I've been helping people who have been abused or defrauded by Scientology. I moved here in 2000. My background is in radio TV film. I started as the morning guy at a radio station in Wisconsin and ended up with an Emmy Award for my work in TV news in San Diego. Great. And I've tried to bring those same types of concern about helping the city, whether it's news or here. Um, and I'd love to be able to continue uh, fighting for clear water. Great, yeah. thank you so much. Now if I pass out with your experience in TV, you take over? Uh, maybe that wouldn't be allowed. Who knows? Mr. Cotton, you now have a minute to tell us why you're the most qualified for this position. Thank you for the question. My name is Ryan Cotton. I am a second generation Clearwater native. Uh, the only native that's going in my race. I am 36 years old and I work as a captain paramedic of the Lauman Special Fire District. The reason I point that out is because I have a unique perspective. I am the only one in my family that has ever worked in government. My grandfather and father both uh, started private sector jobs and have been landowners. So I have a unique view on how business is, in, is run and how a government can be run to be more efficient and productive. Um, I'm also the emergency management coordinator, public education officer, and secondary public information officer for my department. So through those unique characteristics, I've seen a lot of different aspects of how government operates um, and have dealt from things at the federal level to the state level um, to our local municipality in Lelman. It's been very rewarding. I love helping people out, and I look forward to being able to help you all out with the ex vast experience I have from the private side and the government side to help make sure Clearwater stays the home that I know it is. Wow, that was right on time. Thank you so much. Mr. Red. That's what they said earlier on. But Mr. Mastrosario, you now have a minute. Mastrosario. It's Mastrosario. Italian. It's it. Italian for hard work and getting things done. I want to bring ideas and solutions to the council to vote on, not just sit back and wait to vote on them. 
I want to, I run a small business and I get paid for results. I raise my hand to serve others, whether it's a charity, a civic group, or a person who needs a ride to church. I have a passion to serve, to make Clearwater a better place to live, to work, and to play. I am the only candidate who does all three, so I'm fully invested. In nine years, my wife and I have lived here. I've served on 13 organizations in leadership positions. I've helped countless charities and always rolled up my sleeves to serve. My vision is to revitalize downtown, to improve our small business community, to engage more people, to be proactive in delivering solutions. Action, not just talk. That's why I need your vote. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Mr. Leone, what's your, why are you the most qualified for this position? Mr. Uh, Leone. Thank you, Al. Uh, my name is Jared Leone. I'm running for City Council, seat three, and I've dedicated myself to bringing transformative changes to our community for the last 10 years as a volunteer. Uh, I've um, got a little background about me. I have a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Florida and a master's degree in digital journalism from the University of South Florida. And I worked as a journalist for 20 years covering local, state, and national news. And when I stopped covering our community, I started volunteering as the Environmental Advisory Board uh, Chairman, where I've been for the last six years. Um, during this time, I helped resurrect Greenprint, the city's sustainability plan, and advocated for the city to hire a sustainability coordinator. I'm also president of the Spring Branch Neighborhood Association, where we worked with the city to expand State Street Park and secure $700,000 for enhancements. And our neighborhood cleanups have been instrumental in the removal of more than 5,000 pounds of trash in the last four years. I also served as the secretary of Clearwater Neighborhoods Coalition, and I'm vice president at Keeping Ellis Beautiful. Uh, my dedication to our, our community uh, extends beyond it. I've raised five guide dog puppies training for Southeastern Guide Dogs. So thank so you So we much. have three journalists here. You two it so far. Oh, boy. Now the pressure is on. Mr. Menino. Do you mind if I stand? You can stand if you want. Do you mind? I don't want to break any rules already. No, I just started. No. All right, perfect. Police officer says it's all right. You yeah, anyway, thank you. I don't want to break any rules. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for having us. Uh, for the past five months, I've been interviewing with you, the uh, citizens of Clearwater, who will be making the vitally important hire to our Clearwater City Council on March 19th. Some of the things that come up as we're doing these forums are, why are you the best candidate? This is a very good question to start with since we don't have an intro. So very fitting, I, th I thank you. Why am I? Because of my knowledge for the city, my educational foundation, my leadership and job experience are three things that put me different than the other candidates that are on that ballot with me. Number one, I'm born and raised in your city of Clearwater. I've been here my entire life. I am a lifetime parishioner of St. Cecilia's Catholic Church. I'm a graduate of Stetson University later completed a master's degree in public administration. I've served your city on multiple boards, including Chair Persebert's uh, Clearwater's Municipal Advisory Code Board, Clearwater's Charter Review Committee, member of Ford Pinellas Citizens Advisory Committee, as well as I will let you vote for me on the 19th. <laughs> All righty. Mr. Scott, you now have a minute to tell us why you're the most qualified for this position. Good evening. I am the most qualified to serve as your next councilman in seat three because I've already been doing the work. As a resident, I initiated and successfully completed uh, the designation of the area near uh, Pinellas High Innovation, formerly known as Clearwater Intermediate School, as a school zone. As an employee of the city of Clearwater, I have served in various roles, all of which have provided me with greater opportunity to serve you, the residents of Clearwater. Uh, as a worker in our streets and sidewalk division, I helped to reduce our city's backlog and beautify our communities. As a neighborhood services coordinator, I've served as a bridge from our communities to the city government, ensuring that residents have a constant voice inside of City Hall. I believe that now is the time to elect the one who lives, works, and serves in Clearwater daily, not just uh, someone who shows up when it, it is uh, required for board meetings or when they're on the ballot. All right, thank you, Mr. Scott. All right, nerves are all gone, here we go. What is this, and I want you to be as specific as possible on these, what is the city's most pressing issue and what would you do to address it? Mr. Cotton, you go first. So this is something that I've been echoing for those of you who have uh, seen me and it's one of my key issues and I think that critical infrastructure is at the heart of what uh, we should be focusing on right now. Um, as an emergency management coordinator, I see all the after action reports from all of our coastal communities up and down Florida and, and those from around the nation. And uh, we can see the flooding issues that are happening. We can see that 
Um, with Idalia 12 of the pumping stations went online um, with one critical failure. And we can see that we need to invest our tax dollars more wisely. We need to make sure that it's going to the things that aren't so pretty that we don't see every day. And uh, you know, having that previous experience that, that uh, I've spoke of, really putting the money into investing for being resilient. So when you guys have to leave, that the city is functioning when it's time for you to come back and start getting your lives together, that we're there making sure the city is, is sustaining the basic necessary things for life. All right, great. Mr. Master Cesario. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I think that we need to put a new face on the Clearwater. We live in a beautiful area. Everyone knows that. Um, but we need to re uh, revitalize our downtown. We need to change that. And the only way to do that is to take action. We can't sit back for 50 years. We've talked about doing different things and have done nothing. Uh, we have not, there is no partnership. We have to lead. So I want to be the person who leads the fight to take back our streets in downtown. I believe there is an opportunity to do retail, um, mo or retail mobile, um, or should I should say mobile retail, make it clear, mobile retail. Since there's not anywhere that we can rent space for businesses to operate, we need to create those spaces. I'd like to come alongside of building owners who want to renovate their space. I'd like to put leases with buildings and help them open up those buildings. But if they choose not to open up those buildings, we have to go on in a different direction. I do not want to enlarge. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Leon. Thank you. Thanks, so, um, I think um, critical needs our city is going to have to um, accomplish are infrastructure improvements across the city, from flooding issues out on North Beach to um, <clears throat> everybody's neighborhood when it has a, a regular summer storm and you can't get out because of the streets are, are, are flooded. Um, I think supporting uh, smart development that balances our economic needs with our environmental ones and um, and promoting um, programs to help homeowners and businesses retrofit their homes to make them more resilient and, and for powerful storms and power loss will also help um, you know for our, our critical needs so, okay thank you all right Mr. Minuto. Thank you, sir. You don't have to stand for everyone, do you? You know what? I, I enjoy standing yeah, with respect for an audience. Okay, that's that's fine. Hands and I, and that's fine. So if they want me to sit down, I will. No, that's right. It's a, it's a great question, and thank you. Uh, for the past five months, I've been discussing with residents the importance of Clearwater to get back to the basics. And what does getting back to the basic means? Getting back to the basic means truly balancing livability with destination, and that's what Clearwater is. We are a destination city, but we also have a very, very strong desire for our quality of life in our neighborhoods. I think we have to balance that. You do that by providing you, the citizens, with the most efficient city services we can. As we said, we have issues with stormwater drainage. We have issues with critical infrastructure on both sides of our co coast, Cooper's Point as well as the beach. We have to stay on top of those. We must be effective with the way we spend our money and be fiscally responsible, making sound financial decisions. We must find a way to keep our neighborhoods safe and healthy. That's a key to resilient communities. And we absolutely must make Clearwater a more business-friendly environment that's attractive for not only residents and businesses, but visitors alike. All right. Mr. Scott, most pressing issue. I believe that Clearwater's most pressing issue right now is, among many things, uh, is housing. Uh, because uh, we just presented numbers. The city just received numbers yesterday. Uh, that Clearwater is losing its young people because there is nowhere for them to live. They cannot afford to live in Clearwater. Uh, the truth is that a city that does not have any young people or a city uh, that doesn't have lower income families raising children here is a city in decline. And so what do I plan to do? I've presented a plan of action that requires us as a city that I will uh, create consensus among my fellow council members to shift our city strategy to become more proactive in acquiring property that is suitable for housing. And then once we get that property, we determine what housing needs we are in need of, and then utilize that property to the best of our ability for those who are most at need of housing. All right, thank you. Mr. Bunker, we're gonna wrap that up on uh, pre most pressing issue. I, I would have to agree with Javante. Um, affordable housing is a problem everywhere in the country and probably in every city around the world. And one of the first things I did when I uh, was elected was tell our then city manager, Bill Horn, 
that I'd like to see us uh, change the code to allow ADUs, uh, like tiny homes, granny flats, uh, things of that nature, so that uh, we can find a way for some folks to actually find a more livable place that's inexpensive, but also folks who have the property that they can put up a second dwelling, uh, they'll be able to make an extra income, and, and that will help everything. But it's insane that our officers, our firefighters, uh, can't uh, live in the city that they protect. And we can't recruit more businesses if the businesses don't have places for the employees to live. We're going to come back a little later and talk about more affordable housing. And, and I want you to be thinking in terms of I want to go into a little bit more depth than just a, on the surface. Next question. Um, and this one is interesting. Anybody who lives in the area, they go, what streets are there a problem with? And uh, Drew Street. Okay, here we go. <laughs> the Drew Street Improvement Project has run into a number of roadblocks. Do you think another traffic study is necessary, or should the council do whatever it takes to keep that project moving forward? Mr. Mastrosario, you go first. Okay. Um, I'm on record of saying I think there needs to be more studies. I think there should have been a study in the first place that was in real time. Um, even when I asked council members, they didn't even realize that there were 25 bus stops in that area. You take that down to one lane and you're going to have nothing but a log jam, just like is on Fort Harrison. You're going to have people backed up. You're going to have, you have to accommodate buses. You have to accommodate delivery vehicles. You have to accommodate regular traffic, which is four lanes going down to two. Um, you have to worry about the fire and police being able to get somewhere because of the congestion. Everybody wants safe streets. The first thing I think needs to be addressed is speeding. That's what the problem is. The wrecks caused by speeding. So if we would take the, uh, take the police and give everybody a ticket that goes over the speed limit, I don't care if it's five miles over the speed limit, we have to change the way that people go down that road. Okay. Mr. Leone, the same question. Thank you, Al. Uh, do we need another study? No. We've had events at Coachman Park for decades, and um, thousands of visitors have come down to our downtown to enjoy Coachman Park for many, many years. As a member of the Clearwater Neighborhood Coalition Executive Board, I supported efforts to advocate for the Drew Street Complete Streets Project, and the project was initially unanimously supported by the City Council in 2018. Um, only a portion of the street would be reconfigured under the plan in a residential area. And um, while residents need safer and more transit options to get around the city, uh, especially with 500 accidents along that stretch of road, uh, the accidents also um, serve as a way to um, force drivers to avoid the area altogether. And so a project um, with other investment could strengthen surrounding neighborhoods and the small businesses nearby. So thank you. Mr. Menino. Yes, sir. Now, as we're campaigning, this is a very important issue that comes up, obviously, everywhere we go. And too often, this discussion is getting divided into you're either for a safer street or you're against it. And unfortunately, this is not the case. Every single one of us up here are for safer streets in our community. Every single one of us believes in safer streets and making Drew Street safer. However, we must make sure and we must ensure that providing a safer street on Drew Street is a safer street for all drivers, all pedestrians, all bicyclists all transit, all neighborhoods, as well as the businesses. We have to make sure that data that we collect and studies that we use are actual fact factual data, as well as up-to-date data, and data that includes traffic from Capitol Theater, traffic from 10,000 people at a Chicago concert downtown. It has to include deliveries like Amazon and 25 bus stops, and it must include Timu, who comes to my house every single other day, I swear. So. That one lane does make me a concern. We do truly have to sit down and make sure that we are taking the right factual data to make the best decision for all. All right, Mr. Scott, same question. Please restate the question. Yeah, the Drew Street Improvement Project has run into a number of roadblocks. Do you think another traffic study is necessary, or should the council do whatever it takes to move that project forward? From what is public knowledge, uh, the city council has already decided to move forward with the Drew Street Project. There has been a halt at the state level due to a legislative verbiage change and the request uh, for another study. I personally am committed to ensuring that Drew Street, the project is moved forward, that Drew Street is made safer. I don't think we need another study to tell us that Drew Street is not safe. I 
have that same fear that residents have uh, from the mornings when I go to work and the afternoons when I leave and go back home. I have to drive through the intersection of Drew Street and Myrtle, uh, and I have that same fear where I don't know if I should turn because I can't see the cars coming straight, or I don't know if I should keep straight because I don't know if the car who's turning can see me. And so I share that same fear as residents and as their councilman in seat three, I am committed to ensuring that we move Drew Street safer uh, move Drew Street forward to make it safer for residents, those who will drive vehicles, those who will walk, and those who will buy. All right, Mr. Bunker. The people who live in that neighborhood have been begging the city for seven years for help to no avail. This council managed to get that passed, and it's one of the main reasons I want to get reelected because I know that the good old boys are trying to kill that project. And an extra study is exactly what they were going to use to delay it and hopefully get a new council who would vote the way they want. I, I, I'm going to be frank. Uh, Mayor Hibbert w uh, was, uh, this was one of two votes that he lost that uh, got him to quit. And he and uh, our Chamber of Commerce uh, Amplify Clearwater went to the state senator to, to have some uh, something put in the state budget to kill the project, and they failed. But they're not done trying. All right, Mr. Cotton, same question. Yeah, I would uh, not be opposed to a secondary study um, because here's the deal. At the end of the day, I think that we need to make sure we're holding the studies and those are the people that are taking the studies accountable and asking the appropriate questions. I know that there's a street down um, near where I work that they're trying to make a safe street as well. And it will also take a four lane road down to a two. But in that study, it was not an apples to apples comparison. They used a, a road that did not have as much traffic that would flow through it as uh, the street being in question. So not being a part of the council that did decide on the previous study, I just wanna make sure that these people conducting the study are being held accountable for the study that they're proposing. Um, I'm not a traffic control expert. However, I can tell you that if you limit one street, it's just going to cause people to go to another street and make another neighborhood or another street equally as more dangerous. We're seeing it up in the countryside area with the US-19 project that's just started. Citizens were telling me that they're already having speeders cut down 580 to Countryside Boulevard, and Countryside Boulevard has become more dangerous. So it's just going to shift the problem. Okay, great. And if somebody can tell me and figure out what they're doing on US-19, I can't, I can't figure it out. I <laughs> must be going to put a tunnel and go under something. I can't. Whatever. All right. Uh, specifics. Some of you have mentioned some of this in your opening remarks, but again, I want to drill down a little bit. The city is spending a lot of money on downtown projects from the newly renovated Coachman Park, or the Sound, as it's called, the marinas, a new city hall. But what about the neighborhoods? Are they getting enough attention? That is, are they getting enough money for their particular projects. Mr. Leone, you're first. Thanks, Al. Um, <clears throat> short answer, no, they're not. And our neighborhoods have been on the short end of our budget stick for a long, long time. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm here running is to help empower our neighborhoods and ensure that our neighborhoods are uh, as strong as they possibly can be. Uh, our, um, <clears throat> to me, strong neighborhoods make a strong city. And for us to have a strong city, we need to have strong neighborhoods. Uh, we had a backlog of over 10 years for sidewalks for our neighborhoods, and that is a, a simple infrastructure need that shouldn't, shouldn't have that long of a backlog. Mr. Benino. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, another great question. This goes back to what I just said before. It's we must ensure that we're balancing livability with being a destination. I do agree with what's been said. The neighborhoods probably haven't had the voice, the ear, and the presence of council members that they should have and that they need to have. But we cannot, as a city, make this a divided city between economic development and neighborhoods and parks. These truly go together. They are not in opposition. When they truly are balanced together, they both work to make higher paying jobs, create more and bigger jobs. They make your quality of life better. They provide a tax base that drives revenue that allows us to take care of our sidewalks and roadways, but it's truly making sure that your elected officials balance our livability and our destination. Mr. Scott. The answer is no. Uh, residents don't feel as if they've been heard over the years. That's one of the reasons that I've heeded the call to run for city council seat three. Uh, I believe that if residents want a council member who knows, uh, who will 
to make decisions in their best interest. Uh, they want a council member who knows what it's like to be in their shoes, uh, then they ought to choose Javante Scott to be the next councilman in seat three. Uh, because not only have I been a voice in my neighborhood community, uh, but I've been a voice for residents inside of City Hall, and I am committed to doing so once I have resigned from that role uh, as their next councilman in seat three. All right, Mr. Bunker. No, we don't have the commitment to neighborhoods that we need to have. Um, we give millions of dollars to developers for these major projects. And I always wonder, well, why aren't we putting a lot of that money into uh, the pot so that people can get their houses painted, get the roofs fixed, uh, take care of things like that in the neighborhoods. Um, we focus a lot on downtown. Uh, because of the problem, we focus too much on it. We've, uh, we've accomplished what we can there now. So it's time for us to say, okay, we got uh, the downtown working despite Scientology. Now we have to go out and help, uh, especially with the CRA in North Greenwood. Really looking forward to that taking off in this next uh, session. Mr. Cotton. Yeah, I think it's a good question. However, I don't think that's a yes or no answer. I would have to agree with making a relationship. It's in that kind of the gray area in which in any industry you speak of, um, you know, good business drives a good economy, which brings in good jobs, which comes into the neighborhoods. And you have that livability um, that, that helps neighborhoods come along. I think we when we look at uh, Morningside, when we, we look at uh, South Greenwood, we can see recreational complexes that have been invested in that, even Misty Springs with the Countryside Library. I don't think that the city is trying to pick one over the other necessarily, but there is a healthy balance where both can come together and the city as a whole can just rise together. And I think that's what we really need to focus on is not picking one place and, and tackling it, but really how does this benefit everybody and what is it going to do to benefit our citizens, to benefit our tourists, and to benefit our business owners, and, and really use that that guise going forward and trying to make the best decisions for everyone. Mr. Mestrosorio. Um, I have to agree with Mr. Menino and Mr. Cotton. Um, you have to balance it. But the biggest thing I want to say is I want to see others involved. One of the reasons I'm running is for others. Now, the others have to be part of the solution. It's not just the city. The city does a great job right now with their rec centers, with different things. We need to address sidewalks. We need to address uh, problem areas. We need to invest in the people. But the people need to invest in themselves. And when I, when I say that, I'm not talking about dollars. I'm talking about their voice, their time. When you go to a, a, when you go to a, um, a neighborhood association meeting and you see 27,000 people live in the area and 12 people show up, that's not investing. I need people to be part of the solution. I need, thank you all for being here tonight. It means a lot because if we don't hear your voice, we don't hear anything. So we need to be here. We need to hear from the neighborhoods to both of us come together to make a better solution. Okay, our next question, and I'm going to ask you to uh, recall your photographic memory at the budget. Okay, you're looking at the budget right now in your mind. Are there any areas in the current budget you think that are way out of line, or are you satisfied with the city manager's priorities in the upcoming budget year? If not, what would you change? Mr. Menino. Yeah, good question. And we talk um, so often about being fiscally responsible in our community. One thing that, that when I go through and look at your $730 million budget that we've approved with that new 6.1 going to uh, city staff is we're relying on over 45% of your tax dollars right now are coming from your uh, ad valorem taxes, your property taxes. That is an uncomfortably high place to be. In 2009, 2010, our city staff and city leadership told us, you shouldn't be anywhere beyond the 33 to 35% reliance on that. We are extremely too high on that. A downturn in your economy and your housing market, a downturn in an oil spill like in 2010, COVID hits us again and any sort of uh, tourism industry is messed up and our budget is upside down. We do have a lot of responsibilities financially going forward. We need to make sure that we rein that budget in responsibly and not rely so much on our property taxes and tourism. Mr. Scott. In terms of the budget, the city has just been uh, notified, I uh, believe last week, a uh, budget meeting where we've been told that over the next couple of years, we're going to have to take a closer look at the budget and how 
uh, we spend funds for capital improvement projects because if we continue to spend uh, in, in the way we have, uh, at a certain point, around about 2030, uh, we'll be having to raise taxes. And so in order to do so, uh, we've got to start now looking futuristically uh, at this next budget, the 24-25 budget, to make sure that we are making improvements and doing what it takes to ensure that we don't have to do that. I want to be clear, though, in order for residents to continue to have the quality of life that we currently have or for us to increase our quality of life, the increase that we've given to workers is not going to be enough. And so we have to make sure that we be clear. In order for our quality to life to stay what it is, we must and to continue to do what we can to be attractive, to be an attractive workforce. And if necessary, we'll have to take steps to look at changes. Okay. Mr. Bunker. One thing that um that happens in every meeting is we're, we're uh, approving some sort of project that costs millions of dollars, whether it's repairing sewers or replacing uh, the, the fleet of vehicles for, for uh, you know, it's just amazing the amount of money that does get spent. It's not that it's uh, being spent unwisely. Uh, and, and let me, uh, let me bring up one project, maybe you'll ask about later, the city hall. There, there have been charges out there that, that we're building a $90 million city hall, which is a lie. We're building a $30 million city hall with a 30 million, 30, well, 31 million. We had 30 million set aside from the time they left the last city hall to build this. And we finally said, let's get it done. And I, you know, it, I, I, I do not like seeing the lies that get spread in a campaign like this. Okay, great. Mr. Cotton. So with the budget, again, um, I would look at being, looking at it from a fiscally responsible, limited government guy. So we need to make sure our fire and police are there, well-funded, and like I said, our critical infrastructure is working well. Do I think that we should have spent $31 million and a half dollars on a new city hall when we have this wonderful facility that we're sitting in holding this meeting right now? No, I don't. I think that you could have put a good amount of money towards critical infrastructure to make sure that we're staying resilient for the citizens and, and making their money count. Because we all have this wonderful supercomputer at our fingertips nowadays. If I need to get a hold of any of my legislators from the state to the city level, I can look them up. I can see where they meet to, to picket or uh, hold a protest. I can see their emails. I can get their phone numbers. I'll find you if I have to, right? So I don't think that, uh, spending frivolous dollars like that it really needs to, to come down to what do we need making sure we're making those specific changes and i think the critical infrastructure is an area where we're hurting now mr mr Storio. well first of all i'm going to go back to what javante said yes you do need to have good staff you need to, that's one thing that our city is lacking we are short-handed in a lot of departments and just like any business it has to be a well-oiled machine you have to understand in order to keep good people you have to pay them but you have to also keep an eye on the total budget. As Mr. Menino said, we can't be overloaded with payroll. So my, my being in the business field, the only way to make that come together is you need to find new revenue streams. So we have to find, and that's economic development. That is finding places to get more money out of the business community and not on the backs of taxpayers. So there is opportunities to do that. And that's the, I met with the, the finance department. And I said, what are our revenue streams? And there's not enough revenue streams. So we need to create new revenue streams in order to increase our money in so our budget is less. All right. Thank you, Al. Yeah, I think the city can be more efficient in spending our taxpayer money. Uh, the city's budget is more than double what it was 10 years ago with no major investments in infrastructure. And a majority of it is currently spent on staff each year, um, even with over 180 vacant positions. I, um, I know how hard everyone works for their own tax money and to balance their own budget. And I think uh, for, for us as uh, council members, each dollar should be spent um, making sure it's strengthening in our neighborhoods, improving public safety and our quality of life. Thank you. All right. Question number six. We're about halfway there, folks. Take a deep breath. Now we're going to move on to something a little more controversial. Things have been relatively quiet on the Scientology front as compared to other years, and having hosted other debates, I can say that with some 
uh, authority here. Are you satisfied with the city's relationship with Scientology and members of the organization that own over 100 properties, according to the St. Pete Times, in the downtown area, knowing that your city manager and city attorney are working on something, I am told? Uh, uh, Mr. Scott, you're first. Residents are not satisfied with the relationship. I think much of that is because we don't know what's happening. A residents want a downtown that can be in the same conversation as Safety Harbor and Dunedin, uh, and that can some at some point compare uh, to cities like St. Petersburg. In order to do that, uh, the city will need to have, I believe, a relationship with uh, the Church of Scientology. But that relationship and those conversations, I think, should be made public. I think we ought to keep residents up to date and up to speed with the conversations that we are having as much as possible. Uh, but we will have to take a greater look over this next term. Uh, to be sure that we create a downtown uh, that is revitalized and that we give residents an opportunity to have a say and an input in what they'd like to see in that downtown, what will bring them into that downtown to be sure that downtown is diverse and has diverse opportunities uh, for all of our residents in terms of restaurants, uh, entertainment as well. All right. Mr. Bunker, you only have a minute on this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <laughs> The, uh, uh, the downtown, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is a case of racketeering. David Miscavige, the, the leader of Scientology, orchestrated this campaign to, to buy up all of these buildings and leave them empty for eight years. He's created a problem only he can solve. That's racketeering. And that's why I went to the FBI with Mike Render, the former head of the Office of Special Affairs, to talk to them about this, to see if we can get help help on the state level, on the federal level, help from somebody, because this is not right. We cannot partner with Scientology because we're legitimizing all the negative things that they have done over the years. We need to find a way to work with them without being a partner. And my suggestion is always, the scavenge has to come through first. Prove to me that you're going to actually do something then we can talk. Okay, Mr. Cotton. Yeah, so Scientology has been here since I was born at Morton Plant. Um, it has been a rift, it seems, throughout my entire life as Scientology versus the city. And, uh, you know, as I've grown um, under good leadership, good Christian leadership, I've always been taught to make relationships. And you come to the table and you try and work things through. I would absolutely love to see the downtown Clearwater become bigger than St. Pete. People from Tarpon Springs and Largo coming to us instead of people going down to St. Petersburg. I believe we can do it. I think that you just need to treat them like any other organization. Work with them when you can, but work around them if you can, because we need to get this downtown revitalized. I know that we can do it. We have a, a great potential for vitality. Uh, we could have already got a, five good restaurants downtown. Um, we have a wonderful dueling piano bar, and you know I could just see the the different types of attractions having the sound in the new park of, of what can be accomplished. And I think allowing the city to hold conversations with that organization is going to start to put that best foot forward. Mr. Metroscorio? Well, I started my opening statements about this, and um, I'm a firm believer um, in a business you have partnerships, and partnerships are very hard to work with. Um, so you can still do business with people without being in a partnership. Um, but we, you know, I want people to take the, both of us, the city to put their best foot forward and the organization to put their best foot forward. Because if you both do that, you're going to get the best results. That being said, I'm not going to wait for them to do it. I'm going to, I have a plan already. I have, if you want to go to my website, if it's not up already, it will be shortly, but you'll see a plan of mobile retail that I've been talking about. I brought, I've been pushing for five years for containers, but the city came back and said containers won't work because they have to be, uh, there's too much infrastructure has to be changed. So I've came up with another thing, mobile retail. And I believe that we can, there's 28 um, empty spots and there's, 36 empty buildings. Okay. Mr. Leo. Uh, thank you, Al. <clears throat> Property owners are stakeholders in the success of our downtown or in the failure of it. And I think um, what we need is a commercial property vacancy fee to uh, help our downtown businesses, the ones who are working hard, and help our other vacant 
places kind of come online. Uh, if not, then we can help create uh, uh, incentives for our businesses that are working hard downtown. Uh, we can't sit by and say there's nothing we can do about a downtown that's filled with empty buildings in an area with a special designation to target blight. Thank you. Mr. Menino. A uh, very good question. Uh, I campaigned in 2020, lost by less than 2% in a five-person race. This question came up at 1,000 of the 1,200 doors we knocked on. It's a very important question in our community. I'm born and raised in our community. At 12 years old, I used to ride my bike through this downtown area and go to the beach. Problem is, it almost looks the same as when I was 12 years old. That takes a partnership. That takes collaboration. We can use whatever buzzword that we want. The goal as our city is not to make downtown become bigger than St. Pete, bigger than Tampa. The goal of the city has to be to make downtown Clearwater self-sustaining. So downtown can stand on its O2 feet, so downtown doesn't suck from the coffers of the rest of our city and can contribute to your tax base. We have to find a way to build trust. Trust is what moves things. The speed of change moves at trust. We have to build trust somehow on both sides, find little ways to build, collaborate together, and start moving this area of downtown together so we can have a vibrant city where we can work, play, live, learn, and enjoy our quality of life. Okay, another question. What is the city doing to address the so-called blue sky flooding that happens every time we get a heavy rainfall, even though it's not associated with a tropical storm or a hurricane, especially along the North Beach area. Mr. Bunker, you get to go first on that. It's a huge problem, and it is a, a project that we're working on right now. Um, the climate change is going to make it very difficult for us in the decades to come. This is an immediate problem that folks on North Beach have to deal with, and we have to help them fix that. But it, it's only going to get worse. And we can't ignore that. So we, we have to be taking some measures to safeguard the city. One, things, one thing that we've done is we've approved taking two water treatment plants offline who would, that would be completely submerged in a Cat 5 storm. And we're, we're building one major water treatment plant on, you know, out of the flood zone. It's a costly project. That's one of those things that's going to take us a couple of decades to accomplish. But these are types of things that we need to do for the infrastructure. Mr. Cotton? Yeah, this is, again, going into one of my main points of critical infrastructure, and, and it does cost millions of dollars. Uh, the flooding issue out on North Beach has been projected, the numbers out there, between 75 to $100 million to get a hold of the flooding issue and make sure that the, the systems out there were properly taken care of. Uh, and that's a giant number. Um, and I think that when you look at different ways, you have to be smart about how you're spending money and then how you're also getting money. And I know that um, working through FEMA, there's resiliency grants. I would like to make sure that the city manager is taking advantage of any resiliency grants that are out there to uh, harden our infrastructure and bring those dollars from the federal government down here to to help make those changes so i think that there's unique ways um, to go about not just spending local clearwater dollars but again getting a hold of all of the tax dollars we've paid from the state to the federal level and really making these projects come together mr matrasorio uh, first of all, I think you're going to get six pretty much the same answers because we all know there's an infrastructure problem. Um, I don't have a solution. I'm not that type of person. Um, there's where I lean on the other people who know more than I do. I listen to what they're uh, proposing, and I make sure that I do my due diligence and make sure what they're doing is the right, going in the right direction. Um, I think that the uh, city is addressing North Beach quite well. I was at a meeting almost six weeks ago where they addressed it. They told the, you know, what the problem was. They have a short-term solution and a long-term solution. And I think that the city is doing a, a, a phenomenal job of addressing that. We have to, we cannot fix the problem overnight. Uh, as Mark said, there's going to, it's going to take decades to do it right. There's just a number of things, but I have to rely on putting good people around me that I might listen, learn, and then make good decisions for my city. Mr. Leo. Thanks. Uh, addressing resiliency issues is extremely critical. Um, infrastructure def deficiencies like our uh, stormwater um, is extremely important to, to fix. Um, 
but we also need to maintain swale and our and our other capacity for stormwater as well, including dredging ponds, creeks, and lakes, so the water has somewhere else to go. Um, and um, I, I, I think that um, the city is trying to address it, but it's going to take millions of dollars to, to do. So. Okay. Mr. Menino. Yeah, very, um, very important question. Uh, as you called it, blue sky flooding. We, we are hearing this. North Beach gets flooded just from a rain. It's underwater. 15 to 20 houses have water all the way up into their garage. This is a terrible thing to have. You have the same thing going on in the Del Oro neighborhood. I've walked both neighborhoods with the residents. I've stepped through city meetings. They are on capital improvement list. It does say five to 10 years it takes to fix North Beach. It does give you a number of 75 to $100 million. What does that do for the rest of your citizens and the residents? It actually makes your city more resilient. Making your city more resilient makes your community rating by FEMA become a lower number. Making your FEMA rate community rating lower means that your homeowner's insurance goes down. Affordability in our city and our region is a terrible thing right now and finding ways to make it more affordable. This is one of them, working on resiliency and mitigation things that reduce our risk of flooding in our cities and that will reduce the amount of money that you as a citizens pay as well as give relief to these flooding houses. Mr. Scott. The city has presented a plan, our uh, public utilities, public works workers uh, have presented a plan to the council uh, that says a short range, intermediate and long range plan, uh, different time spans of what they plan to do. I had the privilege to uh, door knock in the uh, North Beach area and uh, I was able to see that residents there have uh, made curbs for themselves. The roads have no curb. They have sidewalk with no curb. And if you know anything about uh, rainwater, it needs something to direct it to the drain. Not only is there no curb to direct it, but there's no drain for it to go into. And so I think uh, there's possibility uh, that once uh, I get to the council, there's a couple questions that I want to ask. Uh, one, uh, what roads throughout the city do we need to be repaved? What sidewalks need improvement? What railroad tracks need to be leveled? Uh, what intersections need better drainage to reduce flooding? Uh, those kinds of questions, I think, will give us an adequate picture uh, to ensure that we're ensure next steps, safe next steps for residents and travel for our guests as well. All right, next question. In the past three years, over 2,500 new apartments have been added along the US-19 corridor. What's the city doing to address the traffic congestion caused by these new apartment dwellers? Mr. Cotton. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can look to certain traffic studies that we've done for Drew Street. Going back to that, you know, there's it's definitely something that I think everyone around 3.30, whether you're going north, uh, typically, um, you, you run into. And it's causing other major issues with people trying to find a quicker way on some of our smaller roads. I can't speak specifically to what council is doing right now to address certain things, but I know that the citizens are bringing it to the attention and hopefully they're bringing it to the attention of council members right now. Um, and, you know, something off the cuff that I would like to work with the city on it. Um, we need to know our place as council. We are the legislative policy group. Uh, this city is not a strong mayor. It is run by the city manager, so holding her accountable for things is important, but making sure that she understands that, hey, is there any way to address a traffic problem in this area? And I will use Countryside Boulevard as that area for the detour on the US-19 traffic. They're having speeders uh, on that road trying to get to Curlew quicker. Um, one of the quick ideas was maybe putting a stop sign somewhere along that temporarily to help alleviate that speeding problem. It's issues like that that I think are good ideas. Asking the questions are important. Mr. Master Storio. Uh, first of all, I think that because we have such a beautiful place to live, more people are coming. Uh, there's, as you said, 2,500 apartments. I think there's going to be more coming. So uh, one of the things I need we have to look at is when is enough too much. Um, but right now we're going to have that problem. They're going to continue to put uh, more apartments up. Apartments are less expensive to live in than buying the homes here. So the we talk about affordable housing. These things are at least a step down. It's not affordable housing, but it's a step in the right direction as far as finding uh, living quarters for people. Um, what's it do with the roads? Well, there's going to be roads are going to be over overpopulated. And you're going to have wait times that you're going to have to put up with. And when you move into those areas, you're going to have to make sure that you understand that. Um, we cannot fix everything. As we talk about fixing Drew Street or any countryside or any other street, you're going to see other places get um, populated. So 
we, we, it's, we live in a place where we just say we have to deal with some time as uh, time waits. Okay. Mr. Leo. Thank you, Al. Um, we have a lot of development along 19 because years ago our, our city saw the changes that were coming to that corridor and decided that we needed to change the code along that corridor. And so in doing that, it lured a lot of development there. And now we have the problem of people living in those places that we wanted to have developed there. Um, so to, to deal with that problem that we have now, traffic, it's an issue that we have throughout the Pinellas County. It's the most densely populated county in the, in the state. But we need um, better light timing. We could use more multimodal options and, and safer streets for everyone to get around. Um, so I think um, infrastructure improvements and um, continuing to make sure that the developments that go on to 19 work with each other, uh, we can help alleviate the problem of traffic. Mr. Menino. <clears throat> Transportation is a very important issue in our city that we face with overcrowded, over overpopulated, uh, overbuilding in certain places. US 19 actually I don't think is a very great example. I feel that traffic compared to some of our other city streets as we know moves relatively well thanks to some of those overpasses. Your new overpass that will be built uh, over Curlew, not under it, uh, it'll actually go over it, should alleviate some of that. Um, but yeah, I don't think US-19 is, that, is that, that critical for us right now. I do believe there are other areas in our city that are critical. We do have the smart signals. Unfortunately, our city does not monitor your smart signals and your light systems within our city. That's monitored by the county. I have sat with utilities director in Clearwater. They tell me that their goal for the next two years is to put a Clearwater employee in the county building so that we have a voice of clear water helping give input to monitor some of our light systems and within the next handful of years build our own traffic smart system out of our city which is needed but transportation we have to support multimodal transportation issues in our city it has to mr scott one well, is important to note that us 19 is not necessarily a city street so there's not much we can do there but partner with uh, organizations like for Pinellas state and uh, county officials uh, to be sure that we advocate and share uh, the concerns of residents and how long residents have to sit in traffic on us 19. Uh, one of the things that i've committed to as a next councilman in seat three is to uh, be sure that we work with organizations uh, and uh, transportation companies or agencies uh, to be sure that we do our best to take cars and vehicles off the road. Uh, one of the things that we know as a coastal city, our, our city workers, city staff, and council have been committed to being uh, protecting our environment and environmental stewardship. And in order to do that, one of the things is to uh, reduce our carbon emissions. And to do that, we have to have less gas being emitted. And one of the ways to do that is to reduce uh, traffic, transportation, and giving residents and visitors other means of transport throughout the city. Okay, Mr. Munker. Dealing with any roads, we're, 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 it, it's, it's difficult. Um, and Javante's right. This is a, not a local problem. It's something that state and federal uh, people need to help out with, just like with Drew Street. That was why Drew Street was such a difficult thing to put together, because the city um, runs part of it, the state runs more, and and then, you know, it, it's just all has to come together. Um, we probably need to do a better job with the developers, having them come up with a way to uh, route that traffic. Uh, we, we, I don't know, how many years was it that we were working on 19? It seems just like yesterday that we finished. And it would mean a major project to try to alleviate um, this congestion. So. All right. I promise I'll come back to this question in a little more in detail. Um, and it becomes even more critical as the counties and uh, developers are trying to push for density. That's you hear that density, density, density. But they always forget to go, you need to have transportation to move the people in density, 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 density. So we talked about affordable housing, but there doesn't always seem to be, because I do this with debates everywhere, I don't see anybody who's really got any comprehensive plans to figure out how do you address that? And what's the difference between affordable housing and livable housing? And so my question is, on a local and state level, since no one really seems to be addressing it, or if they do, most of us in the media don't know about it, 
what would you recommend to create the to correct the deficiencies as far as developers to make sure there is in quotes real affordable housing for like you said our teachers and uh, our law enforcement etc mr master spelling when you get to start out on that one well you the question was is a couple of things but we had mentioned at the end developers um with developers they're doing the development to make money um, that's what their job is they they have people that are whether it's a sole proprietorship whether it's a corporation they're doing business to make money and in doing so they have to do the best they can to keep the cost the lowest when you're doing affordable housing or you're going to get government money to come alongside of you so when you talk about affordable housing it's government money coming alongside and that's federal and state not so much city um, but we can have land that we do have available to us that we might offer to a developer. I know that there is a development for affordable housing going to be um, work in the works for uh, South Fort Harrison. Um, and it's going to help the, the nurses and people like that that might have the opportunity, uh, restaurant workers that live to work on the beach. So there's going to be reduced housing cost. But I can't say it's going to be affordable. Okay, Mr. Leon. Thanks, Al. Uh, affordable housing is crucial to the success of the city. Uh, according to the city's residential inventory and housing affordability assessment that um, our council went over earlier this week, 41% of homeowners and 55% of renters in our city are cost burdened by housing. And one way the city council can tackle housing affordability, one way, is by considering a, mul a millage rollback at the next budget discussions. As our property values have continued to rise, the city's maintained the same millage rate, but uh, continues to bring in an increased tax revenue. Uh, we can we can reduce uh, the ta the cost burden homeowners in Clearwater with a, mul a millage rollback. Uh, another way is to work with partners to incentivize um, uh, developments by accessing funding through the Live Local Act and the Sadowski Housing Trust Fund for uh, for potential housing projects throughout the city. All right, thank you, Mr. Menino. Yeah, very important question. I kind of wish we had more than a minute to discuss this because uh, this is an issue with all of our region. So often it's just a buzzword, affordable housing, workforce housing, livable housing, but the conversation stops there. Uh, what is workforce housing? It's 60% below the average median income is what they're built for. So that's what, that's what they're used for. What can we do as a city? As a city, we can lean on our county and state officials. I've been endorsed by two state senators, a state representative, all three county commissioners that are in our backyard, and we can lean on those relationships to ensure that the Sadowski funds are being appropriated for the very thing they're supposed to, that's workforce and affordable housing. The second thing we can do is use our legislative tools that the Live Local Act in Florida gives us. That means that it increases density in some of your single property houses. It increases your vouchers as far as living for some people. It increases your tax credits as far as living. And there's tools like that that we must absolutely use to legislate our way into it. You cannot mandate that onto builders. It must be in, in, um, appropriated appropriately. Mr. Scott. Well, part of the issue that our residents have is that uh, we've been saying, the former council over the years has been saying, uh, that housing is not a city issue, uh, when in regard it is. Uh, I believe that it is. Uh, the numbers that were presented to the council just yesterday show that it is. And so uh, what the local government can do, and I uh, have presented a plan of action that uh, will require us to shift our strategy. I think the city needs to be more proactive in acquiring property that is suitable for housing. And once we do that, then we can take uh, those properties, uh, compare them to the numbers and what we know we need in housing uh, for the residents in Clearwater, and be sure that we put the, the right types of housing on those properties to maximize the property use. Uh, we will have to be careful uh, to be sure that we uh, do not uh, take away too much green space, but because we are a dense city, we have to be critical in being sure that we take as much uh, we take as much property that we can to offer affordable housing to residents uh, and workers. All right, Mr. Roker. I like that I, I can always say, uh, yeah, I agree with Javante, <laughs> but I do. Um, you, we, I wish you could see uh, the planning that our planning department did for the Marina District. They came up with an, a beautiful report that, it, that showed every walkable street, every idea to make a, a terrific neighborhood. Uh, and if we did it, it would be amazing. Unfortunately, 
Scientologists bought up all the property there secretly, just like they did downtown, and they brought in a front guy, and you could check uh, Tracy McManus's article about this. They brought in a front guy who said, okay, we want to put up uh, these huge condo towers, and, and, and the city said, that's not what we want here. And they said, well, okay, we'll just walk. And then we have nothing, and that's supposed to be the economic engine to make uh, the North Greenwood CRA pop. Yeah, Mr. Cotton. So I would agree with utilizing uh, the resources that we have, like the Live Local Act, as well as the Stadowski Fund. Um, it's very important to help do that. I had the privilege of just talking with the Economic Development Housing Director and Assistant Director this past week, and they do have unique um, plans going forward. I'll tell you what one of the biggest challenging challenges is, we live in Pinellas County. We don't have space. Um, so very unique in the way that they weren't talking about going with density up, rather making a uh, triplex or a quad home look like it's part of the neighborhood that you wouldn't even recognize there's multiple people living there. Um, there's different um, ideas that the, the staff are thinking and working on. They were great ideas and, and I think it's a good foot forward. Um, but I also do believe it comes down to building relationships. And, and I also have some endorsements at the state level with Senator Hooper, Kim Burfield, Red, uh, Bernie Jacques, to name a few. And, and being able to be able to rely on those people through relationships to help get money from the state level down here is, is crucial. Okay, so now we're gonna, we're gonna do uh, an interesting thing. Uh, I'm going to ask you who you think is going to win the Super Bowl, and then, no, that's all right. That's right. What about that? Tampa Bay Bucks. Uh, just, wow, that would be an act of God, wouldn't it? Okay. Uh, these are a couple of yes or no questions, and I'm just looking for a simple answer. There's two questions we're going to have, and we're going to go down the table just yes or no. You don't, don't make it, no speeches or anything, just to win let me know, and we're going to put something up on the screen about a proposal about the way elections are being held in the city of Clearwater. Do you agree with a proposal that would require a candidate to win 50% or a majority of the votes in a runoff election versus the current system, which says simply the top vote getter is the winner? Now, we're going to try to throw it up on the screen. If we can't, that's fine. You can look it up on their website. But again, uh, everybody understand? You, I, you, you know this stuff, candidates. You, you better. Okay, so here's, let's just go right down the table. Are you in favor of changing the way that we do the runoff elections in Clearwater? No. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. Wow. That's surprising. Okay, great. Uh, here's another one. Do you think all candidates for elected city position should be required to submit what's called a Form 6, a financial disclosure, in order to run for office? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's great. Now it's time for our closing statements. Each got a minute. You can stand up if you want to. And you can sit down. You can do whatever you want to. And we're just going to go right down the right down the line here. And uh, let's just have at it. Mr. Bunker, go first. All right. I wish we had four council members and a mayor who would stand up to Scientology, but we won't. Uh, but we do, we do need somebody who understands the organization and the way that David Miscavige runs it. But there's a reason why his father wrote a book about him and named it Ruthless. Uh, so I, 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 I think that's important. Um, I hope that you understand, or I got a chance to understand, that I'm not just concentrating on Scientology, though. I'm trying to help every way I can throughout the city. And I, I hope that um, you'll give me another four years uh, to do that. Uh, I'd hate to see the, the good work we've uh, started to accomplish be erased. All right, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Ryan Cotton, you have a minute. Thank you. Um, so I'm a 36-year-old second-generation Clearwater native. This council sat before you six months ago and said that they're looking for younger people to step in. I answered the call. Um, I'm going into my 15th year as a captain paramedic with my fire district. It's been a wonderful career. I love helping people, and I'm looking forward to hopefully helping in another way as a legislator for the city that um, I know and love. My children are fifth generation Clearwater residents, so this is home, and it means a lot. And I want to make sure that it stays a great, beautiful, vibrant place that people want to continue to come to 
and uh, that citizens are able to just enjoy and, and have the vitality of life that they deserve. Um, I look forward to helping that with limited government perspective and holding um, our city manager uh, accountable with transparency and making sure that there's more efficiency within government, as well as looking for the critical infrastructure upgrades that we so desperately need, and then trying to cut back with some bureaucratic red tape that we all are so frustrated with from residents to businesses. So thank you, Al, for the time and the city for hosting. All right, Michael Messasario. I'm ready to work for the city of Clearwater. I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and get things done. I um, have two candidates running against me. They're both very nice people. Um, one has been on, can on the council for four years and has not really brought anything forward to move the needle. The other is um, a son-in-law to a city, si sitting city councilman, which would give a family vote 40%. The other thing is he has a full-time job that's not in the city. And so traffic back and forth Time is an essence. He also has two young children, which has a lot to do with his first priority is to make sure that that is taken care of. That he raises his kids up. So there's travel baseball. And I don't, they're both great candidates. But I have the knowledge. I have the experience. I have the desire. I will listen. I will act. I want to quit talking about stuff. I want to start doing. And I need your vote on March 19th. Thank you and God bless. Seat number three, Jared Leone. Thanks, Al, and thank you, audience, for coming here tonight. I've sat back and I've watched election after elections, and it's always a new face and no changes. I'm here to bring real positive change for our residents, our businesses, and our community. We've had a conservative majority on our city council for more than 20 years, and our budgets continue to rise and our services diminish. That conservative majority has not been fiscally responsible with our money. Instead, our tax money lines the pockets of special interests. I'm not backed by special interests or political parties. I'm a proud registered nonpartisan candidate running in this nonpartisan race. Responsible fiscal spending, improving our infrastructure, and ensuring a safe, high quality of life for every resident in Clearwater is not resigned to one political party. I'm here to represent everyone. In one of the most politically divisive times in our lives, let's not let that culture take root here in Clearwater. This is one of the most important elections for the future of our city. So remember, Jared Leone, the common man for common sense in Clearwater. Vote for Jared Leone on March 19th. Thank you. Michael Leone. Awesome. Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you for moderating. Thank you, staff, for putting on such a good forum and always professionally done together. Thank you all for being here. Much appreciated. And thank you for TV Land for being here. My beautiful wife, thank you for your endless support and love and my family for being here. I said in the beginning, I'm interviewing with you, the citizens who will be making the vitally important hire to our city council. What makes me the most prepared and the best candidate is a couple of things. My knowledge of the city, as I said before, my education, being the only council member that has a master's degree in public administration, as well as I've owned a small business in Clearwater for 12 years, as well as a nonprofit organization that's gifted over $100,000 into our community. My education, my business experience, my leadership experience and knowledge is why I've been endorsed by Clearwater Fire, Clearwater Police, Pinellas Realtors Organization, as well as your business community of Amplify Clearwater. Tonight, I'm here to ask for your endorsement for the next council member of the city of Clearwater for seat, uh, seat number three. I humbly ask you to show up on March 19th and vote for Michael Menino, seat number three. Thank you. All right, Mr. Stop. Some of you may be thinking, he's young, he's got time. Well, I don't have time, and Clearwater doesn't have time uh, to bring the same fluff with no plan of action to the council. On March 19th, either our city will receive more of the same or you can elect me and bring Clearwater's next generation of leadership to the council. Because of my experience as both the resident and city employee, you, the residents of Clearwater, can be sure and confident that I have a plan and a vision for our city and that I am prepared that once I've resigned from my role as a city employee to carry those same experiences to guide me in my decision making as your next councilman in seat three. Now is the time to elect the one who lives, works, and serves in Clearwater daily versus someone who shows up when it is required for board meetings or when their name is on the ballot. My name is Javante Scott, and I look forward to serving you as your next councilman in seat three. Thank you, and good night. Now, just a reminder to the audience again, this is an at-large race, so you will be voting for both seat two and seat three. Thank you so much for watching online. 
And audience, uh, now you can applaud this wonderful candidate for the picture. And just a reminder, we'll be back here again tomorrow with the mayoral candidates that are vying for seat number one, Kathleen Beckman and Bruce Rector. We invite you to come down to City Hall and be a part of that. If not, you can watch us online. I'm Al Rochelle. Have a good evening. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al.